Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. Arm plans to spin off its IoT businesses under the SoftBank banner as it focuses on core chip design business. Autonomous driving startup turns its AI expertise to space for automated satellite operation. A new Chrome experiment may boost your laptop or device battery life by up to 28%. User profiles along with parental controls are finally available for Amazon Prime Video. And Sega's next retro, hard retro hardware is a 1-6 scale multi-game arcade cabinet. Stick around, the full details and this week's Crypto Corner are coming up. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. From the Newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. Arm has announced plans to spin off its two IoT businesses, a move that would effectively transfer the divisions under the broader umbrella of the SoftBank Group, which purchased the chip designer back in 2016. The move comes as Arm seeks to, to focus its efforts exclusively on the semiconductor business that has made the company a ubiquitous presence in the mobile world. The transfer is pending additional review from the company's board, along with standard regulatory reviews, though Arm says it expects the move to be completed before the end of September of this year. While it would effectively remove the IoT platform and treasure data businesses from its brand, the company says it plans to continue to collaborate with the businesses. The company will retain the chip aspect of IoT while leaving the data software and services aspects as their own spin-off businesses. ARM's IoT business has seen quite a bit of success, with its technologies shipping on billions of devices and the planned goal of one trillion expected next decade. Hungarian autonomous driving startup AI Motive is leveraging its technology to address a different industry and growing need, autonomous satellite operation. AI Motive is teaming up with C3S, a supplier of satellite and space-based technologies, to develop a hardware platform for performing AI operations on board satellites. Their AIWare Neural Network Accelerator will be optimized by C3S for use on satellites, which have a set of operating conditions that in many ways resembles those on board cars on the road, but with more stringent requirements in terms of power management and environmental operating hazards. The goal of the team-up is to have AI Motive's technology working on satellites that are actually operational in orbit by the second half of next year. The projected applications of onboard neural, onboard neural network acceleration extend to a number of different functions according to the companies, including telecommunications, earth imaging and observation, autonomously docking satellites with other spacecraft, deep space mining and more. While it's true that most satellites operate essentially in an automated fashion already, meaning they're not generally manually flown at every given moment, true neural network-based onboard AI would provide them with much more autonomy when it comes to performing tasks like imaging a specific area or looking for specific markers in ground or space-based targets. Also, AI Motive and C3S believe that local processing of data has the potential to be a significant game changer when it comes to the satellite business. Currently, most of the processing of data collected by satellites is done after the raw information is transmitted to ground stations. That can actually result in a lot of lag time between data collection and delivery of processed data to customers, particularly when the satellite operator or, or another uh, go-between is acting as the processor on behalf of the client rather than just delivering raw info. There is also more value from a business perspective in selling processed data ready to be consumed. AI Motive's tech could mean that processing happens locally on the satellite where the information is captured. Single board computers and other disruptive tech have shifted toward this kind of computing at the edge in ground-based IoT setups, and it only makes sense to replicate that in space for many of the same reasons, including reducing the time it takes to deliver the process data, which in turn means more responsive service for paying customers. The latest experimental addition to the Chrome browser promises to save a ton of power usage. 
a new flag in the Canary version of Chrome called Throttle JavaScript Timers in Background will cut down on the processing that normally happens in background tabs, and it could add two hours to a laptop's runtime. JavaScript's timers often track user interaction with a web page, checking things like the scroll position and add interaction while the tab is open. This also happens on background tabs, which really isn't useful since by definition a background tab isn't being interacted with. When you have a bunch of tabs open, these timers can chew through a good amount of battery for no reason. Normally, background tabs can trigger a wake up once per second. Now, in Canary, if you turn on the new Throttle JavaScript Timer setting, any tab that has been in the background for more than five minutes will have these timers disabled, with wakeups limited to once per minute. Google ran, some to, uh, sorry, Google ran some tests to see what kind of impact this would have on battery life. For the first test, they used a 2018 15-inch MacBook Pro and loaded up 36 background tabs with a blank foreground tab, then let the laptop run until it died. With the feature turned on, the laptop lasted two hours longer, or 28% longer, than the default settings. That's a huge improvement, and it still can't get, but it still can't get Chrome up to the level of Apple's Safari, which bested Chrome by three hours with the default settings and by one hour with the new throttling flag. The first test showed just how much power can be sucked up by background tabs, but the next test was more of a real world use case. It swapped out of the blank foreground tab for a YouTube video. With an actual foreground task going on, the difference was less dramatic, but still significant. Without throttling tabs, Chrome lasted 4.7 hours, and with throttling, it got an extra 39 minutes, lasting 5.3 hours. Safari was not included in the second test. While these are promising results, Google says they are still investigating how limiting background timers will affect web pages. While Google says that the work done from these JavaScript timers was often not valuable to the user when the page was in the background, they also don't want to break web pages which provide valuable background services like incoming chat and video messages, media playback, and notifications. After a 50% rollout on the Canary version, Google plans to gather feedback from web developers before the change hits the wider Chrome user base. You know, that's an interesting story because for my wife and I, who are both Chrome users, um, we often have a ton of tabs open. I mean, yeah. if I'm doing, you know, research for work or she's doing, you know, different things at home or we're helping the kids with school between their school work and, and the research that they're doing and the, the work that they're working on on their Google Docs, we could at any point have a couple dozen tabs open. And I mean, the, with my, uh, with our family computer, we've got the dual monitors and it's not uncommon for me to have a browser off to the one screen with two dozen tabs and then my main screen where I've got a couple of main tabs. And so to, to have, and, and granted it's not a laptop, but to have that power saving uh, is huge because not only is it less power on the computer that's being used, but over time you could see some savings in your, sure. you know, you mentioned it's not a laptop. And, and one of the things that Becca didn't touch on Jeff was performance. Yeah. And I do think about how even on our desktop computer at home, my youngest will have that same scenario, 20 tabs open, mm -hmm. and then he'll switch user. Oh. Right? So, which is great because Linux Mint allows us to have multiple people logged in at once. But now we've got somebody else logging in and got double hit, the tabs. Yeah. So his Java, JavaScript timers are still going off mm -hmm. in his browser on his profile. Yes. So I wonder how it would affect performance as well. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm very it. interested to see. I mean, I I know it's a small change yeah. going from one second to the one minute, but I'm really looking forward to see the impact because it, I, I do think it's going to be, uh, it will have that, you know, performance power, but, and especially for older devices. Uh, like if, you, if you've got an older laptop that's already struggling I mean, not just battery saving, but if it does improve some of that background performance, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that could breathe, you know, a little bit of extra life into those devices. Good so thoughts. I think it's a great, great idea. Great feature. Yeah, totally agree. 
User profiles along with parental controls are finally available for Amazon Prime Video, and Sega's next retro uh, hardware is a 1 6 scale multi-game arcade cabinet. Becca has these stories coming up, plus Robert is here with the Crypto Corner, so don't go anywhere. Welcome to the world of cryptos and welcome to the Crypto Corner. This week we had, uh, again, a stable market, uh, not, not huge change in the overall market cap. So from 266 billion, we went up to 272 billion. But again, if we saw it after those seven days, we'll see some significant changes, like here VeChain went up by 75% in just seven days, or Aves 57%. In total, we have got over uh, 30 coins that went higher than 15%. And on the downside, we've got only four coins that lost more than 15%. So some interesting dynamic happening in this market, uh, as usual, of course. Now, this week I attended the Cardano Summit. And when you attend the summit, then this is how it will look like, because it has to be virtual. Uh, <clears throat> you have got the tracks where you can go and listen to the presentations. You have got the exhibit, uh, exhibition halls where you can go and uh, even talk to exhibitors. They have got some people on the other side of the computer and you can interact with them. And then the agenda. And this is um, something interesting in regards to Cardano because it highlights the difference between something like, like uh, Ethereum and Cardano. You, Cardano, as you can see here, is full of uh, academic people that did the presentations. And, um, and in... You see, doctor, 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 professor, and so on. And Ethereum is is more the environment of geeks, so uh, fantastic programmers, world best programmers that are coding on the Ethereum blockchain and coming up with new ideas of what to do, like the DeFi market, uh, just uh, is a late uh, development. And in Cardano, they're coming from another angle. They're coming from the intellectual angle, from the, theor the theoretical angle, and that's why it also took them much longer to go live. Uh, rather than um, like Ethereum, they went live very quickly in that sense. So it's interesting to see which one of those two blockchains will have the upper hand uh, long term. Now, going into detail of what has happened, I want to show you some presentations that I really liked. The, this one here is called Beef Chain, which is a supply management uh, or supply chain management uh, protocol together with uh, a legislator from Wyoming. And it highlights the difficulties that exist in this market. Like here, if a salmonella breaks out in one of those factories, the recall can be really devastating. Yeah, Like here, Peanut Corporation of America, that company doesn't exist anymore because of the salmonella outbreak. And executives are, were handed 28 uh, uh, years of prison. And so it's important to really have an end-to-end -end, uh, tool that you can rely on, and that's what they developed on the Cardano blockchain. <clears throat> and I hope they, one day they will also do that on the medical side, because I, uh, I heard that 10% uh, of all medication that you can buy is uh, fake or substandard, and so such a tool would be fantastic also in the medical sector. Next is onboarding. So... Um, I mean, in the Western world, we don't have huge uh, problems in getting access to banks or loans. In other countries, like here, this is Africa, for example, it looks completely different. But how do you do that? You need to make it in a way that it is secure. And that's exactly what they developed here with a project called Atala Prism. And it's a big deal because it simply will open up uh, opportunities like lending, payments, insurance, banking. Uh, so in total, they calculate over 400 billion globally um, in DeFi payments and in Africa that could benefit for, from such a tool. It's just to make sure that uh, you're in a secure way are able to access uh, these uh, finance tools uh, in this case. Yeah, so it's a f f fantastic uh, product for the unbanked. Next one is Cardano aims to be extremely decentralized. At the moment, it's a little bit decentralized. But if you want to have something very decentralized, then you need to offer also tools in regards to the governance. 
and they developed this year with um, on, on the Cardano uh, platform on how the governments look like uh, looks like. It's uh, fantastic and it's well thought through, so it's worth taking a look at. Yeah, so how is the voting done? What can you do with your coins and so on? Then part of the decentralization will be also um, a fund. And as you remember, probably iFund, which was created by Apple to get uh, apps onto into the App Store. Cardano is doing a similar thing now. So they launched um, <coughs> a fund with over 30 million uh, US dollars uh, in it already uh, to fund developers coming up with new ideas. And it will be then the chain governance decides whether those developers will get those uh, grants or not. And they, uh, or they will also be linked to deliverables, which I find uh, fairly attractive. So that's a new way of, of governance of a company or in this case, a project. And the last one that I saw is also that Coinbase Custody, which is just a department of uh, Coinbase, will support uh, secure, stating, uh, uh, secure staking of the Cardano, the ADA, uh, in future. So in total, some really interesting developments on the Cardano platform, which I found interesting because it will shape uh, the industry as we are in. So that's it from me uh, this week. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope uh, you learned something. And please let us know if you've got any questions. So thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye. Thank you, Robert. Just a reminder that we're not providing financial advice, but only sharing what's happening in the cryptocurrency market. Always remember that the cryptocurrency markets are ever-changing and always volatile, so you should only spend what you can afford to lose. Now back to Becca in the newsroom. Thank you, Robbie. At long last, Amazon Prime Video is catching up to competitors like Netflix, Hulu, and Disney Plus with, with a key feature, user profiles. The feature began rolling out in the mobile and set-top box versions of the Prime Video app beginning Tuesday. The feature allows multiple people sharing on Amazon Prime subscription to maintain separate watch histories and watch lists. Additionally, Amazon has made a distinction between user profiles for kids and profiles for adults with different rules. Users can configure up to six profiles in any mix of children's and adult's pro adult profiles. All this is rolling out immediately, but it will take time to reach all users. Multiple user profiles were supported in India and Africa previously, and they are only now making their way to the rest of the world, including the United States. The rollout brings Amazon closer to feature parity with uh, Netflix and other big streaming partners, players. The bulk of major apps in this space offer this feature, but there are some outliers who still don't, like CBS All Access. Some of those other streaming services offer robust parental controls, so Amazon is leaning into that with these changes as well. Individual profiles can be flagged as a kid's profile. That profile will only see recommendations or search results of TV shows and films that are age appropriate, 12 and under, and kids won't be able to make purchases. Amazon is including a number of other options for filtering content like this, including the ability to restrict content on a per device basis. Amazon is making these changes amidst rising competition. Disney Plus has seen massive growth in the recent months and Netflix seems to be faring well also. Large new entrants to the market with massive libraries of exclusive content like HBO Max and Peacock are also hitting the scene, which puts pressure on Prime Video to offer competitive features and content. In terms of content, Amazon is working on a Lord of Rings TV series and it just released a new season of Hannah. The industry giant is also developing a TV series based on the video game franchise Fallout from some of the writers of Behind HBO's from some of the writers behind HBO's Westworld. What I do like about Amazon Prime Video is as an Amazon Prime member, I have it. Right. So while it, it kind of seems like, okay, well, these, there's all these services. You've got to subscribe to 10 different services in order to get the shows that you want. Well, Amazon Prime is part of my Prime service, right. which I get for free shipping. Yes. And priorities and, and stuff like that on Amazon. So it, it really is cool. What I don't like about the profile system on Netflix because there was a time when even Netflix didn't support profiles. Yeah, it's relatively new with like the last six months to a year, isn't it? Uh, it's been a couple years, Is I think, it? Jeff. Yeah, oh, I remember okay. reporting on it when it was new. But what I don't like about it is that there are no pins. 
There are no, right. there's no protection on the profiles. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example. When I first set up profiles on our family Netflix account, I had one for each of my children and then one called parents. Right. And I had it set up so that it was like adult con like not adult content, but you know what I mean? G grown up shows. Yes. Uh, for uh, the parents and the kids were limited to stuff that was age appropriate. Well, it didn't take long before I started hearing from our our child that oh so and so changed my name to Butthead, <laughs> you know, and st oh they changed my avatar to something like whatever. So it, and then it became yeah. like fights. Truth moment. That was you doing it at night, wasn't it? Nah, Just you got out. me. <laughs> yeah. No, so now it's like our our pro I've given up. Our profiles are all ridiculous. Yes. But I, I really wish that Netflix and Amazon Prime, maybe they'll maybe someone will clue in and say, okay, well, the parents should be the only ones who can set those settings. Yes. The parents should be the ones who can configure them. And maybe they, they have a pin-based system so that my like each child could make changes to their own profile, like changing their avatar, changing their name, but not allow trolling right. <laughs> within the family. Yeah. So that's the only biff that I have with it. It's it's a nice feature that uh, that they're rolling out with because um, that's been one of the challenges we've had. Like we have a, we have an Android box at home for the purpose of being able to get Disney Plus and Amazon uh, Prime TV on our home TV because it's not a smart TV or anything like that. So we needed a way to put all those kind of in there. Mm. And um, and and one of the things that I've struggled with is whenever we've gone to Amazon. Uh, to watch their content, there is no way to separate between the kids and the yes. and the adults. And so this is a nice feature they're rolling out. But up until this point, I've not allowed our kids to go on to the Amazon content because right. I don't want them just opening up something and being like, oh, that's, that's different. <laughs> yeah. Or there's the other side of it where, okay, well, each of the three kids is watching The Office, but they're watching it at different places right right so it messes up the queuing so yeah so one of the nice things about online content and streaming video is that you can keep track of which episode you're on well you lose that if you don't have profiles yes so that's another thought yeah. all right we've got to throw back to becca after the release of the Genesis Mini and the recent announcement of the Game Gear Mini, Sega doesn't show any signs of slowing down its plans for miniature retro hardware releases. The company's next entry in the space is the newly announced Astro City Mini, a tiny arcade cabinet set to sport 36 Sega arcade titles. First released to Japanese arcades in 1993, Sega's Astro City was a successor to the smaller 1988 Aero City cabinet. The Astro City Mini will launch by the end of 2020 in Japan for an asking price of 12,800 yen, which is roughly $119. The chassis itself will be at one sixth scale to an actual Astro City cabinet, standing a little more than six and a half inches tall. Based on this scale, this suggests that the original cabinet's 29 inch screen will be reduced to roughly 4.8 inches. The joystick and six button control, however, will be half scale. And that joystick will sport an eight way digital switch, which should be a huge improvement over the squishier analog joystick found on the Neo Geo Mini from 2018. Sega has announced 10 of the system's 36 games with more announcements planned throughout the summer. So far, the list contains Alien Storm, Virtua Fighter, Alien Syndrome, Golden Axe, Altered Beast, Columns 2, Dark Edge, Golden Axe, Revenge of Death Adder, Tant R, and Fantasy Zone. The unit will take micro USB power and will even support HDMI output to a big screen TV. It'll have basic emulation functionality such as save states. There will also be attachable USB control pads sold separately, which allow up to three people to play on the same mini cabinet. Any plans for release outside of Japan have yet to be announced. Thanks for watching the Category 5.tv newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash category 5. From the Category 5.tv newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. 